as vaccinations continue to take place on a massive scale in various countries around the world. There have inevitably been a number of hiccups and challenges throughout the process, causing delays and logistical, is logistical issues. The vaccine rollout has also come with more and more questions about the safety and effectiveness of the drugs, as we hear reports of new variants spreading globally to 50 countries and news of an American physician who died after getting the vaccine. We take a look at some of the issues that health authorities are dealing with as they roll out the vaccine and also address some big questions that the vaccinations are raising among members of the public. For this, I'm joined by Bharat Pankanya, Senior Clinical Research Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School with more than 20 years of experience in communicable disease control and infectious disease management. We also welcome Dr. Bruce Wiley, Ex Executive Director of Public Health Informatics, Computational and Operations Research at City University of New York and a senior contributor for Forbes. Thank you both for joining us today. And well, we have quite a lot of issues to cover. So well, let's get st started and with you, Dr. Pankanya. It seems that vaccination efforts, they are rolling out in the UK, um, but they're coming quite slower than promised. And this has fueled quite a lot of scepticism over the shortages and delays and whether the vaccines will be rolled out on, uh, on schedule. What's the situation right now in the UK? So we have started our immunization program and we are immunizing with both the Pfizer vaccine as well as the AstraZeneca Oxford vac vaccine. The, uh, the program is running, but it could run a lot faster if we had more vaccines in the bottles. So on the one hand, whilst we know that we have got on order 100 million doses, that doesn't mean we have 100 million bottles ready to go. And that is the, the issue that is slowing down our immunization program. If we had the bottles at the ready, we would be immunizing more people faster. And Dr. Lee, what have been some of the complications in rolling out the vaccine in the US? And there was also quite a scare after the New York Times reported that a physician in Florida died after he developed an unusual blood disorder shortly after receiving the Pfizer vaccine. How, how are authorities there responding to this? Well, in terms of the, the case with the uh, physician, so the physician uh, suffered uh, acute immune thrombocytopenia, which is basically a situation in which uh, you ha it's a platelet disorder and ultimately died because of uh, brain hemorrhage. Now, authorities are currently investigating whether this is actually related to the vaccine, because one of the challenges is you know, someone can get the vaccine and for another reason have a medical issue or medical problem. So just because those two things occur simultaneously does not necessarily mean that the vaccine is actually causing the problem. So they really have to determine whether the vaccine is actually linked to that. And that requires time to figure out you know, what the, other, the person's other risk factors might have been uh, and whether this actually may occur in, in other people. So I would say stay tuned and don't automatically assume that this is related to the vaccine. Um, in terms of the rollout, for the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, there's been a number of challenges in the US so far. Uh, so one is if you look at the actual number that has been distributed to the states, it's been lagging in terms of the goals. Like for instance, by the end of 2020, uh, the goal was to immunize or vaccinate uh, um, 20 million people. But when you look at the actual number of doses, it was about 12.4 million doses that were rolled out to the states. And then uh, at the end of 2020, only 2.1 uh, vaccinations had actually occurred. So there are bottlenecks and holdups at all levels uh, throughout the vaccine supply chain. And Dr. Pankanya, we've heard recently about mixing and matching vaccines for the first and second dosages. In what event would this happen? And is it actually safe to do this? Yes, so it's uh, entirely possible to immunize with, say, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine as the first dose and give the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine as the second dose. Uh, at the end of the day, what you are doing is inducing immunity uh, by one, using the nanoparticles to carry the mRNA into the cell to make the spike protein. And in the Oxford AstraZeneca case, you're using a chimpanzee virus to carry the same molecule messenger 
into the cell to make the same spike protein. So it is entirely possible, and these vaccines are not incompatible with each other. And furthermore, to give you my personal experiences and uh, many of my colleagues' experiences, sometimes when we are immunizing with hepatitis B, uh, we find that people just do not seroconvert. And then when we swap vaccines, somehow they do con seroconvert. So actually, there's nothing wrong with it. It works, and it has been shown to work. The biology is quite clear. It will work. And Dr. Lee, now many people are asking whether people who were previously infected with COVID-19 should get the vaccine um, anyway, even if they've already had the virus. And also, will the vaccines protect against co uh, coronavirus variants that we're seeing circulating in the UK and South Africa and now spreading to around 50 countries? We have to keep in mind that natural infection is not necessarily the same as vaccination. First of all, there are many questions of how long the immunity may last after you've been naturally infected with the virus. And that might depend on how severe your, um, your symptoms were and your, your disease might be. And there are cases of um, reinfection uh, that are being documented. It, it's not a, a great number of cases, but there are cases. Uh, the vaccine may be different. Because first of all, you know, you are giving two doses of the vaccine. So you're getting a priming dose. That, so that's supposed to prime the immune system and then a boosting dose later. Uh, so 21 days or 28 days later, depending on which vaccine you get. And that boosting dose is supposed to remind the immune system uh, about the virus and say, OK, you know, this is something that you should be careful about, specifically the spike protein. So it could be that vaccination could provide more effective protection. Uh, than natural uh, immunity. Um, of course, there's still still questions, still studies that need to be done to really look at the difference. But at this time, uh, the recommendation for people who are in the priority group to get the vaccine is to still get the vaccine, um, even if you've been infected previously with the COVID-19 coronavirus. Regarding the variants, so far the indications are that the uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccines, the, the, the ones that are available, should be still effective against the variants. The variants do have some amino acid substitutions in the spike protein, but probably not enough to really affect the response um, to the spike protein. In other words, the vaccines are generating a response to the spike protein. So that should still hold uh, with these variants. But of course, we have to keep an eye on what types of variants may emerge to see if there's a difference in terms of uh, the protective effect that the vac vaccine might offer. So for now, um, Stay tuned, but it seems like that the uh, COVID-19 vaccines will protect against these variants. Well, there's quite a lot of uh, rather odd claims going around about the COVID-19 vaccines. And there were claims that the vaccines could actually alter your DNA and even cause infertility. Uh, Dr. Pancanio, how do vaccines actually interact with your system? And also, what do you think should be done to stop this uh, disinformation regarding the virus from spreading on social media? So these vaccines are really wonderful and they work on a different platform to what we are used to. And let me make it absolutely clear for our viewers and listeners. So these are what we would call messenger RNA vaccines, okay? And what we do is we introduce the messenger RNA into a person's cell. And then that messenger RNA makes the spike protein. Having made the spike protein, the cell pushes the spike protein and expresses it outside its cell. So the immune system recognizes it, makes immune memory and immunity against it. The messenger RNA then degrades. Therefore, it doesn't interfere with your DNA. It doesn't interfere with anything else. It doesn't interfere with any medicines you're taking. In fact, it does very little. It only does one thing make the spike protein and then degrade. Therefore, we expect very, very, very few interactions with medicines you're taking, any conditions that you have, any suboptimal immunity that you may have, any drugs that you may be taking. It is safe uh, on many levels. And um, I would say this vaccines are going to lead the way forward for other developments too. Therapies for cancer, therapies for metabolic disorders, uh, better vaccine manufacture, etc. So we are on the cusp of 
many new discoveries and applications after we've started using these vaccines uh, for SARS-CoV-2 immunization. Well, despite all these uh, I suppose positive uh, prospects for this vaccine, there's uh, a lot of um, people refusing to take the vaccine. And Dr. Lee, there's also news that many frontline workers in the US, including firefighters and also uh, no nursing home staff, they're refusing to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Is their refusal really based on science? And do you think it should maybe be mandatory for them to get the vaccine as they are, uh, what they are um, in the public sector and working with people every day? Well, this shows the importance of pairing up uh, a good communication strategy when you roll out a new vaccine. Because I think one of the things that we've seen in the United States is uh, there wasn't enough information really coming out uh, and going to the different frontline workers in terms of how the vaccine was actually being handled and what the mechanism of the vaccine is. So we really have to pair up um, education and communications efforts to help everyone understand, okay, this is the data that's, that we know in terms of the vaccine. These are how the trials were conducted um, and then help people understand you know, what they are actually getting. And so I think it's uh, not, uh, not surprising that we're seeing uh, vaccine refusals because you really didn't have this kind of communications campaign uh, paired up with the vaccination uh, program. Now, in terms of mandatory vaccination, you know, obviously that's a very controversial, uh, controversial topic. You know, of course, the preference is that people have an understanding of the vaccine and are you know, uh, willing to make a kind of a free choice in terms of what they wanna do. Uh, now, we, we are faced with the, the reality that people who are in the front line are more likely to, um, to be infected with the virus and also more likely to transmit the virus to others, especially those who are vulnerable. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, but um, again, that's, that's under great debate in terms of whether things should be actually mandatory or not. But as you said, the, well, the only way to sort of fight this information is to produce more uh, factual um, information, information mm -hmm. itself, factual, rather being redundant there. But um, yeah, so uh, a lot of public messaging that's needed. And also, uh, Dr. Pankanya, before we go, um, at what point can we say that the wide scale vaccinations are actually effective and working? So we will have to have immunized a large uh, percentage of the population before we see the herd effect, the herd immunity effect, trying to keep the case numbers down. And because we have these new variants, which are more infectious or easy to get infected by, because the, uh, the, the, the amount of virus particles secreted are in large amounts, people get caught by it, people get infected by it. So we may need to immunize not 70%, 80, 85%, which is very unfortunate. But overall, I'm very positive that once you have immunized a large number of people, unfortunately, it will have to go on to large numbers. Uh, you will find that the herd immunity by immunization starts to kick in and we get better control of the outbreak and then we can do better test and tracing. Well, this is where we'll wrap up the discussion today. That was uh, Dr. Bharat Pankanya, se Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter's Medical School, and also Dr. Bruce Wiley, Senior Contributor for Forbes and Professor of Health, Health Policy and Management at City University of New York. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching.